All right, good morning and welcome to Sunday Morning Worship with Mount Olive. Today is uh, the day that the Lord has made, and so we are, we are glad in it. It's a beautiful day. The weather is nice, and I'm back on my back porch leading this worship service, and I'm so glad that you were able to join me this morning. So we're going to go ahead and begin with our invocation. For some reason, my the Facebook Live feed, the camera's doing like a little jump thing. I don't know what that's all about, but we're going to just go ahead with it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. And I'd like to remind you that since we're online and our dialogue is not going to be out loud, so I won't be able to hear your dialogue, please feel free to comment some of the responses and things that you're comfortable with with posting on here. It's a great way to interact. I think it encourages one another for us to see those who are participating. So uh, feel free to put in comments and things throughout the service. I think that's the main reason why we're not just recording these services, we're doing it live, so there is some interaction. Uh, we're gathered together, even though right now it's the, we have some distance apart, but at the same time, we're here online to worship our Lord. All right, moving on to the prayer of the day. The Lord be with you. And also with you, let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you on this beautiful day for the life that you have given us. Lord, as we have gathered this morning to worship, focus our hearts and our minds. Let this time be to your glory to give us strength for this journey of faith, this journey of life. Lord, open our ears to hear what you would have us hear especially the words of promise in your gospel. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So today, we're going to jump right in with our gospel passage. And I told you last week we're beginning a series, and the series is based on a book, and I brought the book with me today. It's by... Uh, Tish Harrison Warden, uh, Warren, who is an Episcopal priest, and actually Anglican priest, but essentially the same thing. And here's the book. You do not have to purchase this book, but it is a good book if you're interested in one that I think would be helpful for your faith journey. It's a great one to pick up. But we started last week with just a little introduction. We're going to carry forward this series for the next few weeks. I don't know how many weeks. And so today's going to be part two of that. Well, really part one, because last week was more of an introduction. We're going to start with our gospel reading, which comes from the gospel of Matthew, chapter three, verses 13 through 17, which you'll recognize as the story of Jesus's baptism. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So this week, uh, the chapter, the first chapter, Reverend Warren talks about waking. She talks about that moment when you are, is the first thing in the morning when your mind wakes up, or maybe it's not even fully awake, but 
you've started to gain consciousness after a night's sleep. And it's that moment where no matter what our what role we play in our daily life, if we're a parent or if we are a um, like an office worker or a business owner, whatever we are in life, you know, we, we put on these roles and we carry out our tasks, the things that we have to do, our work or whatever it is. Well, in that moment of waking, before we do any of that, before, you know, we wake up with a bad breath and the messy hair and, and um, you know, sand in our eyes and we're, we haven't put on that role yet. We're just vulnerable. We're unimpressive. We're human. And it's in that moment that... Um, that we can embrace something very, very sacred. We'll talk about that in a minute. But before we do, I want to ask you a question. And this is something for you to think about. Maybe not try to answer in the comment section. But within your family, maybe answer this question later on as sort of a, a, a an activity. Maybe around your uh, dinner table or something. But my question is, have you ever had one of those really awkward situations where you were awoken by somebody who was not like a close family member. Um, you know, just maybe you were maybe you were taking a nap or maybe you got a phone call in the middle of the night and it wasn't someone that you were super close to. It's such a strange situation when that happens when when we are awoken by someone that we're not very close to. We're our guard is down, and uh, if I get a call in the middle of the night, I try to to get my voice working because I sound like a bullfrog. So people, if they call me, did I wake you up? Or uh, I try not to make people feel bad, but I can't control my voice at that moment. So I, I'm kind of croaky. But I have a, a memory of when I was in high school, and I had a good friend. He came over to my house, spent the night. And he left his pillow at my house. And we had a falling out. I forget what the fight. We're friends again now, but we had some kind of a fight. We weren't talking to each other for a while. And one day, I think it was after school, I had come in and I lay down in my bed and I took a nap, uh, not with his pillow, but the pillow was in the room. And he woke me up. A, a little while later, I guess he had come in to fetch the, the pillow. My parents said, oh, just go on back there and get it. So I woke up and we had this fight. And I had this moment where I thought, is he going to punch me or something? <laughs> and it was so, I just remember how awkward it was and how strange it was for him to wake me up. And I see him there. And I had been peacefully asleep the moment before. We've all had moments like that where... There's this awkwardness when somebody wakes us up. Now, it's not the same, if, you know, if our spouse or a parent or a child wakes us up. That's a normal thing. And they're used to seeing us with our guards down. But someone that we're not as close to, it's a little different. Now, Reverend Warren, in her book, she talks about the baptism of Jesus. And she brings up some really interesting things. Do you all remember the words that were spoken, God's words spoken as Jesus comes up out of the water. Pretty famous words, right? This is, uh, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The exact wording is, this is, yeah, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Now, what's interesting about this is God the Father in this moment, as Jesus is gone to be baptized, he comes up out of the water. He says these words that are just gushing with love and adoration and pride. And what Reverend Warren says, and I think this is really interesting, is at this point in Jesus' story, he hasn't really done anything. I mean, there's nothing that we know. There's no stories of miracles or of teachings. I think in Luke, there is a story of Jesus being in the temple and he asks some questions that are good questions. 
But other than that, before the baptism, Jesus really hasn't done anything, at least nothing worthy of note. We don't have anything recorded of any of his acts or, or words, teachings, anything that he did before his baptism. The baptism really is the beginning. In fact, in Mark's gospel, that's where the gospel begins is at the baptism because that's the starting point of Jesus's ministry. So does anybody know how old Jesus was when he was baptized? If somebody wants to type it in, does anybody know? That's my quiz question right now. How old was Jesus when he was baptized? Okay. Nobody is typing it in, so I'll tell you. He was around 30 years old, okay? So think about that. At this moment of Jesus' baptism, we don't have any record of him doing any mighty acts. Paulette got it. I don't know, maybe I <laughs> Chris got it. Um, we don't have any recorded things in Scripture that Jesus had done anything of note at 30 years old. And there's two things really interesting about that. One is that last week we talked about how the Word became flesh. God became human. And that's a sort of a mind-blowing thing. But this other thing that I think is in some ways just as mind-blowing is that this God who becomes human for 30 years lives a pretty boring, dull, ordinary life. I mean, is that not fascinating? We think about our lives, and if we're lucky, our lives are boring, you know? They're just mundane, ordinary days. And Jesus must have lived three decades of those uh, before this baptism. And yet, when he comes up out of the water at the baptism, God is gushing with love and pride and adoration. That's before he did anything. Now, there's something very important about that. And what's important about that is it sets up a model for how our faith life truly works. That actually, and this is really important, if I was having you do sermon notes, I would say write this down. But the first thing is God's love, acceptance, adoration, his naming and claiming of Jesus, his giving Jesus a... Um, an identity and a purpose with these words is the same thing with us. The first thing that happens in our faith relationship is God loves us. We haven't done anything to earn it. It's unconditional. But that's the, that's the starting point for our relationship with God. Now, our Christian lives then flow out of that, out of that baptism out of that naming and claiming and, and love and acceptance, then God's love is it's to flow through us into the world, into our, our neighbors, Any, actually anyone around us. God's love comes first and it channels through us into the world, or to our family, to our coworkers, to our fellow church members, to our neighbors but it starts with God's love. And even with Jesus, that was the case, that God's love was first, then became the ministry, then came that channeling of God's love into the world. Really, really important for us to pay attention to. And it brings to mind how we baptize infants. You know, I love baptizing, and I, I love holding a baby. I had two babies, and now they're too big for me to hold anymore. And so I get to hold a baby again, and they're so sweet, and they're so lovable. But the reality is babies haven't accomplished a darn thing. Now, maybe they have accomplished raising their heads or, you know, rolling over or something like that. But in reality, they haven't accomplished a whole lot. And yet, we pour this water over their heads and we say these words of promise. 
that you were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, that baby who hasn't accomplished anything is already loved and accepted. Those words of love and adoration that are just gushing out of God's mouth for Jesus is also, are also gushing out of God's mouth for each one of us as we are baptized. And that begins the journey. And what's so special about an infant baptism, and we're happy to baptize adults as well, but what's so special about an infant baptism is it really gets the point across that what is happening is an action from God. This is something God is doing. That love and acceptance is given to us without us having to earn it or do anything for it. It is completely unconditional. So an infant baptism is a beautiful symbol of that. Now, many of us are baptized as infants. Some of us aren't. It doesn't matter at what point you are baptized. We just said Jesus was baptized at age 30. But you could be baptized at whatever age. It doesn't matter. That makes no difference. But even though baptism is a once-in-a-lifetime thing, at least in our tradition, we only baptize once. There's no rebaptism for us. It is something that we claim and remember on a daily basis. And I wanted to read you something that Martin Luther wrote in his small catechism. And you might have a small catechism in your home. If not, even in our ELW, in the back, there is a small catechism. This is on page 1,165 of our ELW. But this is from Martin Luther's small catechism. And the question that he's answering is, what then is the significance of baptism? And he, and he writes, it signifies that the old person in us with all sins and evil desires is to be drowned and die through daily Pay attention to that. Daily sorrow for sin and through repentance. And on the other hand, that daily, a daily, a new person is to come forth and rise up to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. So Luther lifts up this idea that even though baptism is a once in a lifetime experience or event, that there is this daily aspect that we're not rebaptized, but this moment of realizing that God has claimed us, named us, has called us beloved, has has given us significance, a purpose, meaning in this life, an identity. All of that is something we need to remember every single day. Every single day is a fresh start. And in fact, you know, it's not even that it's every single day. You say, well, shoot, I've blown it in the first 10 minutes of getting out of bed. You know, I've, I've done something that I shouldn't have done. It's really a moment by moment thing. When you were baptized, you were constantly being cleansed. You were constantly receiving that gift of grace. And so it's a moment by moment thing. It's a gift given to us. And Luther lifts this up. It's really important. Now, it has been said that Luther said, every day when you wash your face, remember your baptism. Well, I did a little research on that, and that's not true. Luther didn't say that. And the reason we think Luther didn't say that is because in his day and time, people didn't wash their face daily. Uh, for one thing, water was pretty nasty at that time. A lot of times it wasn't very clean. And they didn't have water heaters they probably didn't have access to water like we do. You know, you, you go to the, the town well or whatever to get your water. So it was not part of people's daily routine like it is ours to wash our face. But it's not a bad thing for us to do to remember our baptism each day. And if you remember last week, I said, you know, you might want to try before you even get out of bed in the morning to say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, sort of dedicating your day to God's work and God's will. Now, obviously, we're not going to live up to that, but it's a great reminder for us. So um, so I, I commend that to you. I just got a message popping up here. I'm going to close that down. It's distracting. Um, remember that each day, 
even before you get out of bed, as you wake in the morning and you've, you know, you've got the sleepy in your eye, your, your breath's not great, your hair is a mess, <clears throat> you, you, you're very unimpressive. It's, it's that moment when you're really and truly human, right? You really are who you are. In that moment, before you even get out of bed, I would like for you to call to your mind the fact that you are beloved without anything that you accomplish, without anything that you do for the rest of the day, it, without you being good at your job, without you being a good mother or a good father or a good son or a good daughter, whatever it is, that before any of that, God has already named you and claimed you and called you beloved, and with you, God is well pleased. That's an important word for us to hear because I think we all feel like we don't measure up. So I commend that to you. I hope that becomes a part of your practice in your waking to remember that even with Jesus Christ, that God gushed forth this love and acceptance all before Jesus had really done anything of note. And it's the same for us, that God loves us. And that's the primary thing. That's the first thing. And then the next thing that happens is God's love that is given to us unconditionally and without us earning it flows through us into the world. Amen. So now is the time for the Apostles' Creed. And I had one member this week tell me, since you slowed down the Lord's Prayer, would you go ahead and slow down the Apostles' Creed too? So I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try to profess this. So please profess these words of faith with me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now it's time for our prayers of intercession. Actually, we'll get to that in a minute. I wanted to do, I skipped over some stuff here, or maybe I just got some things out of order. Okay, hold on. Sorry. Um, okay, so I wanted to do a song. And I was trying to think of a song that kind of fit with this baptismal theme. And I chose one that is a favorite of mine. I'm sure it's a favorite of many of yours, too. It's Born in Cry from our ELW, page 732. And the words talk about God's love um, from, in all parts of our lives. An undeserved love, a, an unconditional love. God loves us because God loves us. We can't do anything to earn it. Let me grab a sip of something to drink. All right. <clears throat> I was there to hear your burning cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoice the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. I was there when you were but a child with a faith to suit you well. In a blaze of light you wandered off to find where demons dwell. 
Uh, when you heard the wonder of the word, I was there to cheer you on. You were raised to praise the living Lord, to whom you now belong. If you find someone to share your time, and you join your hearts as one, I'll be there to make your verses rhyme from dusk till rising sun. In the middle ages of your life, not too old, no longer young. I'll be there to guide you through the night, complete what I've begun. When the evening gently closes in, and you shut your weary eyes, I'll be there as I have always been, with just one more surprise. I was there to hear your morning cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoiced the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. And now we will pray our prayers of the church. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. All your creation praises you. The earth hums, the seas pulse, the stars shine, and the galaxies whirl in glorious harmonies to honor you. Let us hear and blend our voices in the song. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The countries of the world experience disunity and conflict. We set our minds on fear and greed rather than on your rule of justice and steadfast love. Build up all countries on your cornerstone of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We still weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. Cradle the fearful, the suffering, and the dying. Assure them of your loving presence. We pray today especially for all those who have lost jobs and businesses, those suffering from this evil virus, and those who mourn for lost loved ones, and all those that we name before you right now, silently or aloud, and please feel free if you want to type in a name for the prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Risen Lord, you went ahead of us to the grave and defeated the powers of evil. Inspire us to live our lives in this resurrection hope and draw us to you in our final days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all those in health care and those in service professions. Guard them from illness and give them rest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And normally in this time of the service, if we were gathered together physically, we would receive an offering. I want to say just a word of thanks for your generosity, your continued faithfulness and giving to our ministries. Again, without your financial support, we could not continue to fulfill all the obligations that we have planned to, to do in ministry. So thank you so much. 
um, I do think it's important this time to say for those of you who are experiencing financial hardship, um, extraordinary financial hardship because of recent events, please, uh, please do not feel um, feel guilty about not being able to give as much as you would like. Um, we um, we appreciate those who are able to give and who can give, and then those who aren't able to give financially to please just pray for the ministry and um, support us in that way. And I would like to offer an offering prayer. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A couple announcements I'd like to share. Please continue to pray for Eric Griggs and his family. His mother, Bobby Griggs, passed away recently. And his father, Edsel, has had some health problems. And I just learned this morning that Edsel's been diagnosed with COVID-19. So keep him in your prayers. Keep Eric and Eric's family in your prayers. They've really gone through a lot. Please pray for Jim Williams, who is having outpatient surgery tomorrow morning. And be praying, continue praying for Ann Lyerly who recently was diagnosed with cancer, very serious cancer. Also pray for all those who are in the path of this illness, those who have contracted the illness, and those in the front line caring for them. I want to encourage you to continue to check your email regularly and also the Facebook group to see the content or any kind of announcements. It really helps us. We do use the One Call Now phone tree, but if you are checking online, it helps us with communication in this time of social distancing. And I know that Deacons Lynn and Liz are working very hard to create content and to engage you all that way. So um, you, can, you can find those things on email and also our website and especially though our Facebook group. If you don't have Facebook, you're watching this on YouTube, again, I really, really encourage you to get Facebook. It's a great way to, to communicate with the congregation and stay engaged. A couple ministry opportunities that I want to uh, lift up. First of all, before we get to that, some of you got little uh, quarantine or stay-at-home care bags from me that I tried to just hang on doorknobs this week. And I only got around to a little over 20 families. I'm going to continue doing that this coming week. I'm going to I'm doing my very best to get around to every single home, but it's going to take a little while. We have a lot of homes, and uh, some of us are pretty spread out, so it's going to take a while. But my intention is not to meet with anybody face to face, but just to hang that bag as a sign that I miss you, I love you, I'm praying for you. I can't wait for us to be able to come back together and uh, be a church the way that we're used to, the way that we would choose to. Uh, this th We're so blessed in the meantime to have these other means of gathering together. But but uh, this is just a way to let you know that, uh, that you are missed, you are loved, you're prayed for. So, so I don't know when you'll get that if you haven't gotten one yet, but I am working my very best to get that to you as soon as I can. So continue to pray for one another. Uh, also, call and check on one another. I think that's very important that we continue to do that. 
the Hickory Soup Kitchen is still ex- uh, accepting those individually packaged desserts like cookies, brownies, that kind of thing. If you like to bake, it's a great thing to do. Also, we have an outreach focus for May, and this is really important. All food banks across the country are really in special need right now. Their supplies are dwindling. They're running low. The food bank that we are closest to, sort of the hub for the Hickory area, is CCM, or the Greater Hickory CCM, Crisis uh, Crisis Christian Ministry, or Cooperative Christian Ministry. So we have sent out with our newsletters, those who receive the physical copies of the newsletter, the snail mail newsletters, some love offering envelopes. We're encouraging you to give a love offering to CCM. But what you would do is to make that check out to Mount Olive, but in the memo line, put Greater Hickory Cooperative Christian Ministry or uh, GH. CCM. So the reason we want to do that is that if it, we don't keep any of that money at the church, but what we'll do is we'll we'll put all of that into an account. We'll write one big check, and we'll know how much as a church we raised. Now here's the advantage of giving money over giving uh, pe- non-perishable foods. Now you're welcome to do that if you have non-perishable foods, canned foods, things like that that you want to bring up to the church and leave at one of the entrance areas, and we'll make sure those get to CCM. But the the benefit of doing a love offering is this. The CCM has the ability, they have certain people that they buy their food from, and they can buy food. that A dollar to them can be stretched so much farther than we can. So if you send them a love offering, they can do so much more with that money than you could even going to a place like uh, the dollar store because they're able to get food from like federally supported food banks and things like that. So I encourage you to give an offering. That would be the first thing. This is all throughout, throughout May. Send it into the church with Mount, right at to Mount Olive, but in the memo line, put CCM, and we'll make sure that money goes directly to them, but we, we're just going to write one big check for that. And in doing so, we really are helping our community. I, I can't tell you how many people go to get food there, but they do a lot of, a, a lot of ministry, and uh, they, they're a fantastic ministry in our community. We want to support them. So those are all the announcements and ways that you can serve this this coming week. So I want to leave you with a blessing and dismissal. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. It's still Easter, so are you ready for it? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. I miss you. I love you. Thanks for showing up. It's good to see all of you in the comments. And I always go through and read the comments after the service. But thank you for being here. And um, I'll see you again soon.